If you would, take your Heavenly Highway Sin books and turn over to the second double zero. <laughs> Revive us again. Double zero. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again number 45 page 45 I am just a weary pilgrim plodding through this world of sin getting ready for that city when the saints go marching in when the saints come marching in, when the saints come marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in the number. When the saints go marching in, my father loved the Savior. What a soldier he had been! But his steps will be more steady as the saints go marching in. When the saints come marching in, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. And Mother, may God bless her, I can see her now and then, with a robe of white around her, when the saints go marching in. When the saints come marching in, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Up there I'll see the Savior who redeemed my soul from sin. With extended hands he'll greet me when the saints go marching in. When the saints come marching in, when the saints come marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Thank you. May be seated. Turn over to page number 258. Page 258. <laughs> change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have a light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came 
came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Was a joy or my soul like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wanderings and going astray, since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Was a joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure Since Jesus moved into my heart And no dark clouds of doubt Pathway obscured Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart There's a light in the valley The death now for me Since Jesus came into my heart In the gates of the city Beyond I can see Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go and dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Jesus came into my heart, was a joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. And one more this evening, please turn over to page number 141. Page 141. <laughs> Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take that cross and follow, follow me, where he leads me I will follow, where he leads me I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. judgment I'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him with him all the way where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him, with him, all the way. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will 
give me grace and glory and go with me, with me all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him. King's kids are dismissed. Appreciate Miss Kalen filling in for Miss Kim playing the piano. Appreciate that so much. Know everything keeps going. Amen. Brother Ethan, why don't you come? Give us what the Lord has given you. Appreciate you being here, preaching for us this evening. Well, good evening. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, will be in verse 21. When you find your place, please stand to honor the reading of God's Word. Judges 16, verse 21 says, But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. I entitled my sermon this evening, See to God's Work. So I went up in prayer. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to come and study your word. Pray that you'd watch over me as I present the message, Lord, that you'd it'd be a, presented in a way that's pleasing to you, and I pray that you'd open all of our hearts to it, that you give us wisdom and understanding as we grow our relationship with you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. I do not like to use the word character because this might imply that this is just a story. So I'll say Samson's role is one of my most favorite events to take place in the Bible. I'd be lying if I said I like the character of Samson. This dude was foolish on so many levels and it destroyed his life right in front of his eyes. Then it destroyed his eyes. Through the, though through his successes and many failures, there's a lot to learn, but there's some context with a set and setting. Setting is one of the few things that I retained from English class of all my career at, through my high school. It means, the setting definition being, the place or type of surroundings where something is positioned or where an event takes place. It's vital to any story or event. This finally clicked when the historical settings of one of the books that we were studying drastically affected everything. It was right after a war had ended, right in the 60s. You can imagine we as students needed to know that information to understand why the author wrote the way she did. So in the book of Judges, we see the last judge sent, Samson. His birth is miraculous, following the pattern of Abraham and Sarah's, who, like Samson's parents, received an angelic messenger before his miraculous birth. The angel foretold Samson's birth to his mother in Judges chapter 13, verse 5. Thirteen five says, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Born a part of God's people, the Israelites living life as a Nazarite in opposition to the Philistines. The Israelites had disregarded what Moses had urged years earlier in Deuteronomy 12.8. Let me get there real quick. It says, Ye, ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Compare that with Judges 17, verse 6. Hopping all over the place. Judges 17, 6 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that, was, that which was right in his own eyes. This is the description of Samson's society, a sad description, and we see later in the book that it concludes with that same sad statement repeated in chapter 21. Keep this in mind as we take a look at the first scene in which adult Samson is introduced, where he's courting disobedience by attempting to marry a Philistine woman. Judges chapter 14, verse 2. Ooh. 
It says, And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Tamnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. In Deuteronomy, this, this is the last time I'm, I'm, turning, I'm turning back to Deuteronomy. It's important. We've got we to see the, the crossover here and why Samson is not doing the right thing. Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4, listen to this. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. He's talking about the Philistines. Thy daughters thou shalt not give unto thy, his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. A big warning that Samson elects to ignore. Samson's words to his parents are telling, go get her from Go get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. This phrase captures more than Samson's simple attraction. It, it reveals the condition of his heart. The exact same phrasing is used in chapter 14, verse 7. This outlines Samson, famously known for his strength, but could still be rendered useless due to the human heart. Proverbs 16, 9, a, man deviseth, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. A lot of the time, the problem isn't the problem. The way we think about the problem is. We need to fix our problems by fixing our thought process. Samson's case is attachment according to his eyes, ignoring God's word. We cannot attach ourselves to a specific person, place, company, or project. I've learned this the hard way by pridefully attaching myself to the military just to see that plan fall through. My priorities were off and it was necessary for God's work. And that trouble could have been avoided if I had just had my eyes set on God's goal. The sustainable way to live life is to attach ourselves to three things, a mission, the future, and a set of values. The mission being God's work, the future being God's plan, and the values being His Word. When we build a dependency on His perfect work, then can we accomplish things above ourselves. I have the perfect scripture on how to accomplish such a task. It's in Galatians chapter Galatians chapter 5, if you would make your way there, because I didn't mark it, and it's going to take me a minute. There it is. Okay. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19, and I'll read down to verse 24. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts." A whole slew of things that prevent us from coming into the Kingdom of God and thus preventing any dependency on His work. As well as the famous list of fruits that we gain through yielding to His Spirit, aka crucifying the flesh with all of its lusts and affections. We need to die to ourselves daily, and if that's not a habit, it is a huge problem. To wake up, recognize my stance in God's work, and what I need to hurdle before accomplishing said work is crucial. Otherwise, it's just another Tuesday that isn't dedicated to the Lord. As people, we think, oh, these foundational truths. I've heard this a hundred times. The Bible has reoccurring lessons and themes, and let me just add, there are infinite points to be drawn from the Bible and applied to a person's life. But the reason God places famous events and lessons into a teacher's heart is because we have a tendency to move on. Let me not apply myself. I'm 18. I memorized the fruits of the Spirit when I was 10. And no kidding, I, had to, I forgot them and had to rememorize them to learn the point I'm making now. As people, totally on par for the course to forget things. But as Christians, we're called to that higher responsibility to revisit and make sure our life is in line with His work. And that starts by taking the total by making the total attachment to His Word daily, to revisit and make sure our life is in line with His work, and that's, that's mm, okay, moving on. Starting my morning with a proverb that's, that correlates with the day of the month has been a tremendous help. It's comparable to tying my shoes in the morning, making sure I'm set, ready to go mentally, and knowing that the chance of tripping on myself has been decreased. 
We need to never act what's right in our, in our own eyes, but ensure we have a total surrender to His Word and entitle ourselves to every mistake that this flesh can make. Sandwiched between the author's two statements of this Philistine woman being right in Samson's eyes is another insignificant encounter. As Samson and his parents are on their way to talk with their future bride, Samson meets a young lion on the road. Though he had nothing to defend himself, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he killed the animal with his bare hands. We see this in Judges 14, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. It's been a while, but I went to the zoo the other week, and it was it was really cool to see all those animals. When I was a kid going to the zoo on field trips, it was like a little show, but revisiting and seeing all the extravagant animals that just that are wandering on other parts of the world, it was mind blowing. A little envious, but also a fearful respect for the ones that could rip me in half. A lion, though smaller than a bear, is stronger and faster and would win in a fight to the death. It is said that a single swipe of a lion's paw would cripple a human. They are six times stronger than the average human, and Samson splits the lion as if he was fighting a kid, otherwise known as a baby goat. This lion seems to have been the great encourager, if you will, in using God's divine strength though, through Samson. But until that moment, there's no mention of it. I see it as that lions have been allowed to roar at us, that we might be driven back upon God, putting us in situations that make us depend on His infinite resources. Again, it's that dependency on God that yields great things. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The world falls to fear of the lion, but the Christian, the Christian through the Holy Spirit has the fear of the Lord. The framing of Samson's life thus far highlights uh, a great irony. Though physically strong, Samson is morally weak. Samson's words to his parents revealed the condition of his heart. And shortly after this incident, the author again states the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him before Samson goes and kills 30 Philistines. The next chapter we read, you'd read again, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him before he goes and slaughters 1,000 Philistines with a donkey's jawbone, which is just metal. But despite Samson's disobedience, the Spirit of the Lord came on came upon him time after time, enabling him to accomplish these incredible feats of strength. I'll be the first to admit, I look back in hindsight all the time and realize if God wasn't doing His perfect work, I would have been so lost by myself. All this said though, Samson lacked any dependency on God and his moral compass. After reading Samson's brief relationship with his Philistine wife and with a prostitute, Samson's sin will bring his story to an end in chapter 16 verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Delilah be later begins to start pressuring Samson to reveal the secret of his great strength. He lies to her three times and finally, she just has enough and says, you, you, you don't really love me. Your heart's not with me. You've mocked me these three times. And you've not told me where your great strength lies. That is the biggest red flag that you could possibly find in a woman. That does not add up to love. Everything he mentions or lies to mention up until this point is used against him each of those three times. So it begs the question, why in the world would Samson finally give in to Delilah's questioning? It's because she's requiring him to prove his love and allegiance to her. Samson's idolatry of women, and now Delilah in particular, has made him weaker than ever before and has brought him down to a very dangerous place, spiritual blindness. So Samson tells Delilah his secret. After learning the source of Samson's strength, Delilah tells the Philistines, and after she cuts his hair, we're told that his strength left him. Sure enough, the Philistines came, seized him, gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. Samson has given both his strength and his eyes to the people rather than to God. The man who has already been shown to be spiritually weak now becomes physically weak. Picking apart the irony, he was shown to be spiritually blind but has now become physically blind. He was shown to be a spiritual slave to his sin and has now become a slave in the literal flesh. Which brings me to my second and final point, God's sovereignty. The story does not end here. 
While being publicly humiliated in the temple of the Philistine God, Samson is called call to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God. That's found in chapter 16, verse 28. At this earnest prayer, Samson's strength is returned upon him. He pushes against the pillars, causing the roof of the temple to fall, crushing everyone underneath. Samson dies while conquering God's enemies. The author sums up the final tragic irony, and that's the last time I'll try to pronounce irony. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Even in the last moments of his seemingly failed life, God uses Samson for his biggest victory yet. His with a capital H because it all worked out for God's glory. There's a mysterious theme in this narrative of God's sovereignty over Samson's sin. Given the dramatic fashion in which his birth was announced, I would have thought that his life would have been more righteous and ended less tragically. Yet that was not the case. Early on in the story, as Samson is pursuing his Philistine wife, his parents attempt to reason with him. In chapter 14, verse 3, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of, of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Samson is determined. And indeed, the author makes this significant remark uh, soon after this. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. The author included this for a reason. I did like four double takes at this verse. God worked through Samson's sin in order to accomplish his people's victory. Yes, tragic where Samson's choices brought him, and there's a powerful lesson of attachment there. But what this does is outline God's sovereignty and the fact that he is always in control. I'll conclude with this thought. The very first lesson that I learned in church that stuck with me daily from that point on was that God uses suffering for His perfect work. First Peter uh, 1, chapter 6, you don't have to turn there. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. It's a popular verse. First Peter 1, 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are all in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7, That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might, not, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Totally lost my place. Okay, here Peter reveals that trials come with a purpose. They exist for a reason. For the Christian believer, blessings come out of our trials. In James chapter 2, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, says, My brethren, count it all a joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, wanting nothing is important. My mom has shared me uh, a verse. I'm not, I'm not going to try to remember anything because I'm totally going to bitch it. But as humans, like it, it was in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20, that the lust of our eyes can never be filled. And as, as we let patience have her perfect work, uh, as our eyes, and when we follow our eyes, it, it'll just leave us wanting more. But patience, according to this verse, will leave us wanting nothing, which is miraculous and shouldn't be undermined. Samson's faith was only displayed when God was using him to gain victory over the Philistines. On the, on the other hand, his life, was rough, his life was rough due to his trials where his choices brought him. The heat of his trials were by no means comfortable. And that's why in verse 4 of this text tells us to let patience have her perfect work. Unlike earthly gold, our faith will continue to be of great value even in eternity. 1 Peter 4.14, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. In their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Teaching and growing is a process of suffering. Life is a process of suffering. When it comes to God's work, He will bring good out of our trials, which is suffering for us in the present, but should never prevent us from rejoicing and glorifying God from the blessings we receive. They test, purify, and prove our faith. For the people who think, well, that kind of seems harsh. God just puts us through the ringer. You've got John 3.30 backwards. It intently first says he must increase. Well, how? We got to decrease through our trials, and God puts us through those. 
when trials come, the believers make that choice to continue to trust God in and through that trial. Mark my words, God will always continue to provide, and our faith will have opportunity to grow stronger. But forget my words, mark God's words. Philippians 4:19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's hard to do my boy Samson like this, but the cause of his fall was in himself. He did it, and he did it freely. The devil himself cannot push a man down against his own will. His life, his fall was very gradual and was a journey that he couldn't perceive. He had, not, he had been pampering his appetite, gratifying his desires, and deflecting any of the blame, and thus he gradually slid away from the righteous and the true. It seems he had lost his power before he was even aware of its importance. The loss of divine power is gradual and impossible to see the process. No outward event announced its loss. No one action within signified its end. Samson, time and time again, went into emergency mode, depending on God till his affections ultimately made him fall. Just as a cup of water can render a stack of papers useless, so does the attachment of sin to our lives. The power of lust-filled pride is crippling, blinding, and destructive. What are you going to do with a stack of soggy papers? Nothing. I tried it yesterday, got my cup of water, stack of papers, poured it on there, and all I created was a big old mess. Couldn't write on, couldn't write on any of it. Couldn't write no words, couldn't draw no pictures. It was all a soggy, nasty mess that I had to clean up. Sorry, Mom. And I couldn't fold nothing to a little origami bird. All its potential of daily use was stripped away when that water interceded. Pretty proud of that one. Uh, <laughs> what are we going to do with a self-destructive pride within a finite creation of God? Well, we ought to have faith and make what's right in our eyes parallel God's goal. In conclusion, He truly is sovereign. He has a great love for His creation and will gain victory through His almighty work. I encourage you this evening to see to God's work, understand His plan and His ability to use you, and whether that path will be rough and sin-filled or righteous and rewarding is up to us. It is up to us to dedicate ourselves to God's work. It is our responsibility to see to His perfect plan and to approach it righteously according to His Word. That's it. Sorry it was relatively short, but it was a true pleasure to go through and study the life of Samson. I recommend reading Judges 13 through 16, maybe 30, 30 45 minute read. I don't know, I'm a slow reader, but who knows. It's well worth the entertaining of entertaining display of amazing power, as well as a tremendous lesson on God's sovereignty. Thank you. I'll leave those thoughts with you, and I'll close us out in prayer. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to go through your word and learn from Samson's life, even though it was very tragic. Lord, I pray that uh, we take the lessons from it and grow our relationship with you. I pray that you continue to watch over and protect everyone, keep them, hope, keep them safe as they head home, and bring us back safely Sunday. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's great. Thank you. Amen. That's a good study. Amen. A couple of things I really like what he said there. He said, you fix problems by fixing your thought process. That's where it starts. Amen. It's all the things that we dwell on and think on. It's funny how your actions follow after uh, the things in your mind. And uh, things in your mind follow things from your heart. And uh, boy, it's, it's amazing that heart's desperately wicked. Who could know it? You know, it's the voice. Start fixing your heart, fixing your thoughts, and it's amazing how it, it shapes things up. The other thing that I love, he said, he, he lost the uh, Samson lost the power before he knew its value. And man, isn't that the truth? Uh, a lot of times we do that. We we get to the we get to the end of life and and realize the great things that God wanted to accomplish, the power that He had to do so, and, and a lot of times we sacrifice it whenever we're following after the flesh instead. I appreciate the points, and that was wonderful. Uh, we're going to take just a couple of minutes break, and then we'll come right back and, uh, and uh, have our quick business meeting right after. All right.